Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Crossroads Church exists to bring a real God to real people, right? And the girl on that video is really good looking, and she's my wife right here in the front row. And it's our son's two-year birthday today, our, our youngest, Eli. And uh, she just sent me a video this morning of him waking up, and she's upstairs, and hey, how are you doing? And he's all happy, and he got cookies for breakfast, so <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, this is our last week in the series of Walking with a Limp. This has been an amazing series, dealing with pain. It, it, we all go through this. We all go through pain. We all have a limp of sorts in our life. But there was this guy walking down a sidewalk one day, and he, he sees this old guy dragging his foot like this, just a bum leg, and he's like, man, what's going on? And, he, and so he asked the guy, he said, what, what happened, sir? And he said it was... World War II, 80 years ago. He said, wow, thank you. Thank you for your service. And he keeps walking down the street, and he sees another guy walking like this with a bum leg. He said, sir, what happened to you? He said, Vietnam, 60 years ago. He's like, thank you for your service, sir. I appreciate it. And then he keeps walking down the sidewalk, and there's another guy walking the same way. Like, <laughs> he goes, what's going on? He said, sir, what happened to you? He said, dog poo, 30 feet back. <laughs> I hear you're supposed to start a sermon with a joke, so there's my joke. <laughs> but some of you have noticed that I walk with a limp. Sometimes it's worse than others, but um, I have a 357 hole in my leg to remind myself how dumb I can be. And I'm going to tell you that story, but also how grateful I am to be alive, because God did a miracle that day, and I'm so grateful that I'm even here telling you the story. But uh, just so you know, I am an amazing golfer now. I used to have two feet, and then I got a hole in one. Um, I'm not a good golfer, actually. Don't ever take me golfing. I'd embarrass you. But in 2012, I was on a, back a backpacking trip with my buddy, my sister, and his sister way up in the mountains of Montana where I grew up. <clears throat> and the trailhead was about 30 minutes from the nearest tiny town, and we were about five to seven miles up from the trailhead. So we were way out in, in the middle of nowhere. It, there was nothing out there at all. We were having a wonderful time. We actually, that's, that's the picture of that lake. We took that the day before this happened. And uh, we made it up to the lake, and smooth sailing was amazing. My buddy brought steaks in a Ziploc bag, and then the Ziploc bag leaked, and there was, it was, the steaks were great, though. It was totally worth it. And we built a raft. You can see on the next slide, we built a raft um, just out of logs, and we were having a good time in the lake. That's my sister right there and my buddy. And um, we stayed the night. We had a couple tents. I'm never going to sleep that close to my friend again. Um... <laughs> And we were about to head back the next day, and uh, my buddy had brought a 357 revolver for bears. It's bear country out there. You had to hang your food up in the trees and all that stuff. But we never saw any bears, but he, uh, he had brought a gun for safety for that. And I was reloading it, and I finished reloading it, and it's all a bit blurry because this is all right before this happened. But uh, I think I had pulled the hammer back with my thumb, but not all the way. And maybe I had my finger on the trigger when it snapped back or something. But all I know is that I heard a bang. And then I tried to figure out what that was. It happened so fast that I, was, I was, found myself just, it was like a daze. And then I felt this heat in my leg. And thank God my dad had taught me um, gun safety because my friend and my, my sister and his sister were all within about 15 feet of me when this happened. Um, and it could have been one of them, and I'm glad it wasn't. But uh, I felt this heat, and I looked down, and there's <laughs> blood shooting out of my leg. And I'm like, oh, it's me. It's definitely me. Um, which brings me to my first point, and this, this story sucks to tell sometimes because it wasn't a smart thing I did, right? But God will keep, he will give you a limp to keep you humble sometimes. And uh, I'm reminded a lot how dumb I can be. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells the story, he said, Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And when I'm telling this story, I've told it so many times, I'm reminded of two things. Number one, my stupidity. And number two, the goodness of God. After this moment happened, I can recall at least six miracles that were countable that God did that day. 
and it's the reason I'm, in, I'm even alive or able to walk. And I'm going to share those with you because I really think that this ties in, like we can look at life, we can look at our pain in so many different ways. And I can look at this as a stupid thing and a thing I wish had never happened, which I do often, or I can see it as the goodness of God. And it's reminded, I, I, was, I grew up in a very sheltered home, I was homeschooled, I didn't have a, a story, you know, like one of those drugs to Jesus or um, marijuana to the master. And, you know, I didn't have any of that. <laughs> I was like, so I was like, Lord, give me a story. Well, he gave me a story. It wasn't the one that I picked, but he gave me a story to tell. And I, I love telling it because it is a story of the goodness of God. But the day before, God started the miracle the, the day before we left when my buddy sent his mom to the, to the ammo store to get ammo. And she knows guns. She's not dumb. She had been a mountain woman her whole life. Like she knew what different types of ammo and there's the solid point and hollow point. When a hollow point hits something, it spreads and goes everywhere and mutilates anything in its path. When a, when a solid point hits something, it goes straight through, punches a hole through it. Hollow point's great for bears because they're huge. He always got hollow point for this gun. Sent his mom to the store. She, she came back with solid point. And he said, why did you, why'd you get that, mom? We never get solid point. She said, I asked him for hollow point and he gave me and it, well, it's too late now. Let's put this in the gun. It was the first time that gun had ever had that ammo in it. And if, if you know anything about guns, you know that if it had been the other way around, I would not have a foot. I might not have my life. So God started the miracles before this even happened. Now, right after this happened, we realized very quickly there's no cell service up there at all. And my buddy knew that there had been cell service like four miles back down the trail so he could hike. And thank God he brought this buddy for this day because this guy is a stinking mountain goat. He can hike faster than just about anybody I know. He's crazy. And he had two choices to either go back to where he knew there was cell service or take a chance and try to go up the mountain and see if he could find some. And he felt like the Lord was telling him to go up the mountain. So he starts hiking, doing his mountain goat thing, right? And I'm back at the, you know, back at the lake just praying to God that I still have a life in, in 20 minutes. And, and he, he starts booking it up the mountain and he found some cell service and he tried to make a call and he dropped it before he could get the information in. And so he starts hoofing it up the mountain again, and they called him back at the perfect split second. And he said if he even moved his head to the side, it would go away. But he, he had cell service there enough to tell him where they were and what had happened, and they sent the helicopter out. And the next worry started because there was so much smoke that year from the fires. The, the, the forest fires would get terrible. Um, we actually have pictures of this. Um, <laughs> this, this. The smoke was so bad that you, could, you couldn't even see the top of the mountain from where we were. Um, you can kind of see some haze right there, but uh, for three hours that day, the smoke cleared out of, the, out of the valley, and it was like perfectly blue sky almost. It was crazy because that hadn't been like that for like three weeks. The fires were so bad. The smoke was so thick. You couldn't even see the top of the mountain, and so God cleared it out so they could find us because they were worried they wouldn't be able to find us, and it was, God just did another miracle for that. It was amazing. The lake, we had just been up to that same lake like two months earlier, and it had been so high that there would have been no place to land a helicopter, but it had been so dry that year that the lake went down so far that there was actually a nice little rocky beach for them to land right there. And that was within like 50 yards of me. It was amazing. So uh, you can see, like, we all look really happy right here because it was like Christmas Day. Like, the helicopter actually got to us. That, they were hoping they wouldn't have to carry me back on a stretcher. But the, this girl, my sister's friend, my buddy's sister, had, had already tourniqueted up just enough to not let me lose my leg and not, also not let me lose too much blood. It was incredible. But looking back... I see, like, the next two days were crazy. It was kind of a blur. I was all drugged up when I got there. And, and the foot specialist saw me two days later. He was the best guy in, in the three-state area or whatever. And I went to see him, and he touched the bottom of my foot, and he said, can you feel that? And I said, yeah. And his mouth just dropped to the floor. And he said, what? You can feel that? And I said, yeah, aren't I supposed to? <laughs> He's like, well, yeah, but you shouldn't have any nerves left in your foot at all. You should not be able to feel this. This, isn't, this is crazy. And it missed the main artery in my leg by a tiny bit. It barely nicked my Achilles tendon but didn't sever it. Like it, it. If there was a path to take, it took the perfect path. And that was all God. I saw the nurse a couple months later that had seen me, the first nurse that saw me in the ER when I flew in on the helicopter. Um, I was working in as an auto technician for my dad at the time, and, and she came to actually get her car fixed. I don't know how she got her number or anything like that. I don't think it was even related to this. But she walks in, and my dad goes, this is the nurse that saw you in the ER. Of course, I didn't even remember her because I was so gone by then that I couldn't even <laughs> remember her. But I, I met her, I shook her hand, and told her thank you. And she looked me dead in the eye, and she said, I've been in this business a long time, and I wasn't going to tell you that day, but I didn't think you'd ever walk again. And then I knew it was like miracle, miracle upon miracle upon miracle that I'm even here, that I can walk, and I'm so grateful. And looking back, would I give anything to relive that day so I wouldn't have to live in, in pain the rest of my life? I don't know. 
Because looking back, he used every single one of those things to cement my calling in my heart and to strip away all the things that didn't matter in my life. So would my life even look the same if that didn't happen? Would I have the blessings that I have now if that hadn't happened? Probably not. And that's the incredible thing, that, that if we knew everything that God knows right now, we would make the same decisions he's making right now for us. So if you're wondering why God's not answering you or, or the answer isn't what you thought it would be, just know that if you knew everything he knows right now, you'd make the same decisions he's making. Number two, God will use your limp to strip away everything that isn't vital to your calling. See, I'd been getting pretty crazy that year. I was a young kid and there was this beautiful woman I was trying to uh, attract. Her name was Hillary, and I started doing a lot of crazy things. Uh, I decided that year that I wanted to learn how to do a backflip on flat ground, and so I I'd, I'd learned that. And a lot of things that probably could have hurt me. And I was filling my life with things that were fun and good, but they didn't have anything to do with my calling. And after that happened, I remember thinking, I may never be able to walk again. I may never be able to run again. And I was devastated because those things meant a lot to me. But a close friend of mine had asked me to play bass for a big worship event in the, in the most prominent theater of Missoula, Montana, where I grew up. And I was really looking forward to it. And when this accident happened, I'm like, he's not going to want a guy that has, you know, has to sit down on a chair with a you know, cast on his leg playing bass. He's going to want someone with good stage presence and can be able to jump around. And I, I called him and I said, hey, man, I'd still love to play, but I, I totally get it if, if it's not going to work out because I'm not going to even be able to stand up. And he said, I'd still love for you to play. And I remember sitting there. That's the picture of that event right there. I was on stage and I was so grateful. And I told myself, I don't really even care if I ever get to walk again because I'm doing what I'm made to do right now, and that's music. And in that moment, on stage, I realized I'd still be okay if I never got to walk again. And more importantly, God used this incident to bring Hillary and I close together. We, we discovered in that moment, and when I was up on that mountain laying there with a bum leg and realizing I might not make it out of here, the first person I thought of was Hillary. I was like, I've got to get a hold of her. I've got to call her. And that, at that point, we were barely dating. Like, we had just started dating and we weren't that serious, but God cemented that in my heart, and he made me realize how important she really was to me. And I think the same thing happened in the next few weeks when she had to take care of me every single day and realize that she really actually likes taking care of me, I guess. Um, and then I copied and pasted myself, and now she has to take care of four of me. Um, but <laughs> it did cement our relationship in a way, and I think it made us realize how much we really cared about each other. Uh, and I don't think that would have happened. I'm sure we would have still ended up together, but like... God used that to cement us together, and it was pretty incredible to see. Um, but here's what I know about you. You want to do something that matters with your life. I've always wanted to do something that matters, and we sometimes wonder if what we do does matter. You want to leave a legacy. You want your life to have purpose. And here's what else I know about you. You have a pain in your heart that you can't get rid of. Something has happened to you, and it hurts so bad. Something you did that you regret forever. You regret it so much that you feel like you can never be forgiven. Or something or someone that you lost that you'll never get back. You'll never get back. Yesterday, I, I did a funeral for some dear friends of mine who lost their 18-day-old baby girl. And it was devastating because they'll never get her back. They'll never get those memories that they thought they would have. And that pain's going to last for a long time. And today we're going to look at the same thing in the life of Jacob who we've been talking about, how God gave him a limp on his hip. And that was one of the things he dealt with. But the pain in his heart was far worse. And a couple of these stories just hit me like crazy. In Genesis 35, it says, Then they moved on from Bethel. While they were still some distance from Ephrath, Rachel began to give birth and had great difficulty. And as she was having great difficulty in childbirth, the midwife said to her, Don't despair, for you have another son. As she breathed her last, for she was dying, she named her son Ben-Oni, but his father named him Benjamin. And if I'm right, Ben-Oni means son of my pain or something like that. And Benjamin means son of my right hand. So you can even see the perspective change there. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is in Bethlehem. Over her tomb, Jacob set up a pillar, and on this day, that pillar still marks Rachel's tomb. See, at this point, Jacob had already experienced everything. His childhood is conniving, his issues with his brother, the birthright, fighting with God, thought he was going to die from his brother, all the things with his father-in-law getting tricked into having two wives and only loving one of them. All this stuff had already happened. And Rachel, if you remember right, was the one woman he actually loved. 
and she gave him his two favorite sons, which it's not good to have favorite kids, and you'll see that in a second, but if I understand anything, th these are the two sons from his, the one woman that he actually loved. And now she was gone. So now Jacob had a wound, a limp, so to speak, in his heart. And then he took a second hit. And here we pick this up. So when the Midianite merchants came by, Joseph's brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. The favorite kid had now become the hated kid because all the other brothers knew that he was the favorite. Him and his brother Benjamin were the two favorites. And they hated him. His brother was still too young to be out in the fields, but he was out there and they got him and they sold him. And when Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He was trying to save his little brother. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe. They slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son for many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And you can feel the pain in, jo in jo Joseph's heart, in Jacob's heart right now. He's just struggling with this. And, and, and this pain is like unconsolable. All his family was trying to t console him and he couldn't. So now he lost his wife, the one, the one woman he ever loved. And now he lost the one son and he's only got one left and that's Benjamin. And you, you can imagine if you're in, in his shoes, you're not letting that kid go anywhere. <laughs> that kid ain't, ain't going out of the house. Can I go ride my bike? No, no, you're not going anywhere. You're going to sit here in a padded room. And Joseph, later we picked up the story, and Joseph had gotten sold to Egypt, right? And then he became the ruler of Egypt. And you can feel this pain if you fast forward to the story of Joseph when they had, his brothers had to go get food, and they met him, and he recognized them, but they didn't recognize him yet. It had been so many years. And then he starts messing with them. Don't tell me you wouldn't do the same thing. I mean, he could have killed him, but he just starts messing with him. And he said, he's like, and since he knew they didn't recognize him, he just starts messing with their heads a little bit just to make them scared. But really deep down, he wanted to see his little brother. And so he tells them, if you don't bring the little brother back, because he kept questioning them, do you have any more family? Do you have any brothers? And, and he knew the answer, but they were trying to, they're scared, right? They're, yeah, we have a little brother. He said, if you don't bring your little brother back, you don't get any more food from me. And so now they're back at home pleading with dad. We got to let Benjamin go or else this guy's going to kill us. He's, gonna, he's not going to give us any more food and we're all going to die here. And his dad is grappling with this pain and you can hear it. He said, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me. And I said, he has surely been torn to pieces and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. And you can feel the struggle in his heart. And this is where the fear of the loss meets the need to let go. If you don't let go, your limp will continue to hold you back. If you do let go of the pain, if you release it, if you give it to God, he's ready to take it and form something beautiful with it. So number three, God wants to take your limp and use it to make your legacy. He wants to take that very pain that you thought would never go away. And it may never go away, but he's going to take that and form something beautiful with it. You can hold on, but you'll never know what could be. He could have hold on to Benjamin he could have said, no, he's not going. I don't care if we all die here. He's not going. He could have held on. Or you can let go and risk losing it forever. If he let Benjamin go out that door, he knows what's happened to his older brother. He could lose him forever too. I don't know if Jacob knew what the right thing to do was, but he knew, I think, deep down that he had to let go. Jacob had no idea what that decision would mean down the road, but he chose to let go of the one thing he had left of the love of his life. He let go of Benjamin. And guess what? God brought him back with Joseph. And with him, he brought the path to promise for all of us. And you see this, Joseph said later, he said, you intended to harm me. He was talking to his brothers. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So this last one being called Jacob's legacy, I was thinking, what is Jacob's legacy? And then I started thinking, what is a legacy? Because we talk about legacy a lot. We want to leave a legacy. What does that actually mean? So I had to look it up in Webster's Dictionary. I Googled it first, and it talked a lot about software that's so old that everyone hates it, but you have to keep it. 
anyway? Any software guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But a true legacy comes from the word Lego. Parents, you know exactly what a Lego is at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> to send, to bequeath, bequest, a particular thing or certain sum of money given by last will or testament. Then I had to look up bequest because I'm homeschooled and I didn't know what that meant. And bequest means something left by a will, a legacy. And I think, what's, what did Jacob leave? What was his actual legacy? He, he was rich. He had a lot of stuff that he gave to his kids, but that wasn't his legacy. His legacy was the promise of Jesus, and that lived inside him. See, the legacy was way before the promise was made to Abraham, his grandfather. And that's why they say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because those were the three that God gave the promise to. And he said, God will bless the whole earth through you. And he said this to Abraham years earlier, and he said, I, will, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. See, when God swears, there's nothing bigger than him, so he swears by himself that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities and their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. All nations on earth, that means you and me. So what's the legacy? The legacy is the promise of Jesus. Jer Jacob carried in his body the promise that God would bless all earth through his offspring. And God changed his name when he touched his hip and gave him that limp. He gave him the name Israel. He literally carried in his body the country of Israel. That, that was going to come from his descendants. He was the carrier of the promise. And if he hadn't let this go, their whole family would have died right there if he hadn't to let this pain go, if he hadn't to let Benjamin out the door. His whole family, that whole legacy, the whole promise of Jesus would have died right there. And because he made that decision to let it go, God brought it back. Number four, the legacy you leave for your kids, for your family, for the people behind you will either be your pain or God's promise. See, my parents both came from broken homes with alcoholic dads and they chose to do things different. Were my parents perfect? Absolutely not. They messed up a lot of things themselves, but they loved me and they chose to do it different because they wanted better for their kids and they broke the legacy of the sin and the pain and they turned it into a legacy that they taught, they taught us about Jesus and, and we grew up with that. And my wife's parents grew up from a broken home with alcoholic dads and they chose to stay together, to love each other, to go through the hardship and both of us have parents that are still married to each other. How crazy is that in this day and age? And because of that, we're able to give our kids a legacy because they chose that. So your legacy you leave will either be your pain or God's promise. He used Jacob's willingness to let go as the path for the nation to stay alive and get to the promised land. And many generations later, guess who came from Jacob's lineage? It was Jesus. All those Bible chapters with the, the son of, the son of, and he begat, and he begat, and you're like, why is this in there? The Jews used to memorize all those. So if I was sitting here today, I could tell you every one of my ancestors all the way back to Adam. That's how good they were at this because they understood the importance of where they came from. And sometimes you have to know where you came from to recognize God's promises because they, they would say, you came from so-and-so, and God promised that guy this. And so you hold in yourself the promise that God gave your great, 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 great grandfather. Sometimes you have to know where you've been to recognize God's promises. So your big idea today, the one thing I want to leave you with, if you remember only one thing today, I want it to be this. To leave a legacy, somebody has to die. That sounds real hopeful, doesn't it? See, you can have a big inheritance coming. You can have rich parents. You can have all that coming. But it only becomes a reality when your parents pass away. That's why parents, we've got to be kind to our kids. They might get that inheritance way sooner. But the, the key to the promise is the death. And Jesus painted such a beautiful picture of this. He said, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Jesus' death was the key to the promise that we got of forgiveness because he broke the power of sin. And he demonstrated us that that in, in our lives to leave a legacy somebody has to die or something so what's it going to be two things can't be alive and well in your heart it's either your wants my wants my desires my pride my sin or it's God's promise those things both can't live in my heart at the same time we have to let one go kill it off and let it die 
And this is a constant daily struggle. It's not something that I just go one time, I'm gonna let that unforgiveness go and I'm not gonna be angry about that anymore because then the next day it comes and something happens and it swells up again and we gotta kill it again. Just as Jesus said in Luke 9, he said, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. It's this dichotomy that we gotta figure out which one in our heart is going to live and die. And it can be either your pain or God's promise. Maybe you already know Jesus and you can't seem to, to shake that guilt in your heart. Maybe it's that trauma, that thing that happened to you and you just can't let it go, you can't forgive it. Maybe it's that addiction that you can't kick, that secret sin that you just need to tell somebody about. Maybe you're suffering so bad, the pain is so real and you just don't see the point. And you're asking God, why did you make me suffer like this? I don't get it. Maybe the pain is so great, the anxiety is so strong that you can barely function. And people are telling you, you need drugs and you need this and you need that. You can find hope in this gem of a passage. I love this. It says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace, which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings in the pain, in the suffering, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might dare to die. But God demonstrates his love, own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died and unlocked that promise. What's it going to be for you? Are you going to kill that today? Kill that pain? Kill that addiction? Kill that, that thing that's eating your heart? So that you can unlock the promise of Jesus. It's a daily thing. It's a daily choice that we have to make. So Jesus, I, I ask right now in this seat, every single person we know, I know, those things in our hearts that we need to just let die. And we feel like it's just too much to let go. We don't know what will happen if we let go. It's scary. We've never done it before. But Lord, I pray that you'd give each and every single person in this room right now a glimpse of what their life could be if we let go of that, that thing. It's different for every one of us. Because you don't know the promises that lay on the other side when you give that thing up. Your legacy, the things people remember you by, the things that you're gonna do, the people that God are gonna put into your life because you let that thing go is going to be so far beyond your imagination you can't even believe it right now. Just imagine what your life would look like without that pain, without that addiction, without that hurt eating at you every day, without that anxiety. Imagine what it would look like Lord, help us to make the choice every single day when we wake up to kill that thing, to let your promise live true in our life, to let your promise come alive in us. And if there's anybody here that's never met Jesus before, he wants so bad to have a relationship with you right now. He wants so bad to start that process and give you a new heart and a new mind and help you overcome. It's not just about going to heaven when you die. It's helping you overcome the sin and the addiction and the hurt and the pain and the struggle and the anxiety and the things that are eating you alive right now in this life so that you can truly enjoy the time with your family, that you can get your marriage back, so that you can get your relationship with your kids back, so that you can be the friend you've always wanted to be, the husband, the wife, the employee, the son, the daughter that you've always wanted to be. Jesus wants to give you that right now and start that process, if you'll let him. He's, not, he's knocking at the door, the Bible says, but he's not gonna force his way in. That's not who he is. He wants a relationship with you, but he's not gonna force himself on you. So if you want it, you gotta open the door and let him in. Will you do that today? If you've never made that choice, I ask you right now to just to say these words with me and mean them. They're no magic words, but just to say these words, we can all say them together. Just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, I thank you. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. 
or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.